awesome, awesome to be here with you all today. Um, I used to sit right there in those seats, actually like in the second or third row on the right-hand side. That was like my seat. Um, but it's a great honor to be here, and I don't believe I ever left. And I see um, Professor Banerjee here. It's always good to see you um, and some other familiar faces. But um, I came to back to the city of Compton to make a difference. And being a public um, policy urban planner, we all know the importance that place has on people's quality of life and really how people perceive the world and what type of impact they're able to make into the world. And so as a student here, I used to think about what types of communities did I want to serve in? And um, I see another professor there, good to see you. Um, and I thought about when I look at communities that are very affluent and communities that um, what people quite frankly want to live in, I said, what's the difference between those communities and communities um, that are underrepresented? And what I used to always consider was, I really believe that it's really just good policy and also great leadership. And so I made a concerted effort to make the decision to work in underrepresented communities in order to make an impact. And we all know that we can kind of have this whole game plan of what we're going to do when um, we grow up. But I never ever thought that I would be a mayor. Um, I thought that I would be a practitioner and I would work behind the scenes and go and have a nice quiet life and to be a very private person and raise a couple of kids with my husband and call life a day. But um, <laughs> as we can see, that's not what happened. And I have, um, I'm gonna blame some of my um, fellow students. So whoever you're kind of grouped up in, because we know that there's always a presentation for everything, especially in um, SPPD, but your classmates really can have a tremendous impact on really, I think, how you perceive yourself and then also how you're able to challenge yourself in your environment um, and briefly with my introduction I had a group of awesome people throughout my master's program and they always thought that I would be a great politician because I was a problem solver in the group but um, and I never thought that I would ever be a politician because I said who wants to be a politician who wants to you know deal with all the, the political landscape and we know that's the problem right but when you are able to really work in municipalities and work in that environment you see very quickly that in order to change the outcomes you have to change the policies and so I was really able to see after eight years of working in various communities that we really need to have equipped people to make policies that matter and policies that can really make an impact on the majority of people. And so that whole mindset is really what shaped uh, my vision for the city of Compton. Um, quickly, my family grew up in Compton when it was a very beautiful community. I grew up in Pasadena and my husband and I moved back and I live in a transit oriented development right off the blue line and I thought if other communities can transform, why can't Compton? And so I moved back to Compton on the preface of making an impact on um, a micro level. My husband was crazy enough to allow me to do that and to be supportive. And so what we saw when we got there is that there's a community full of opportunity, but definitely in need of some new leadership, a vision, a strategy, and also some great partners. And so we're gonna talk about this today. And the title of my presentation is, rebuilding a community from the ground up in a practitioner's perspective. Because I think that when we begin to look at the different types of policies, it's very important to have that experience on the ground floor because you can really see what works, you can see what matters, and what can make an impact for a whole system and not something that just glosses over things. So here we go. So my vision is, and this is as a result of an empowerment congress, I brought some community leaders together and we spent um, about a week here at USC with Supervisor Mark Willie Thomas and his organization, the Empowerment Congress, and we started to talk about, you know, what is the vision for Compton? Um, and we decided that through putting all these different words that matter in different terms, we came up with the a um, vision statement, which is a community united for a safe, prosperous, educated, and economically vibrant city. And that's a city that's balanced, right? That's a city that really has everything that um, you would need to succeed, and I think it hits all the areas of a prosperous community. And so these are the challenges, and what I call ground zero. Um, Compton has an infamous identity. There are very few people, um, show of your hands if you're not from the state of California, just raise your hand. And then keep your hands up. How many of you all had not heard about Compton? Keep your hand up. So we have 
one per two people who had never heard of the city of Compton with a room full of many people who are not even from the state of California. So that just shows you the impact of, I think, pop culture and then also media can have on a community. And then public safety. Um, Compton was known for gang violence and gangs, but Compton is much safer than it was 15 years ago. We have reduced crime um, over the last 13 years by 67%. So Compton is a much safer community now than it was in the past. We also have fiscal constraints. Um, we were on the border of many, like many other California cities of discussing options of bankruptcy, having amassed a huge deficit. We had about $42 million deficit, um, which we still have. And $20 million of that was from internal borrowing, which AKA is poor management and no fiscal controls. And so we had to re-implement physical controls and then also put the city on a payment plan over the next 20 years to pay down that debt. And then we also have the educational system that has a poor perception. Most people, when you think about raising your kids, you're not going to think, let me move to the city of Compton and put my kids in public school, right? And the truth of that is that we have API scores that are extremely high for our elementary um, schools and they are literally at the top of the charts in the state of California. But then we also have a very strong preschool system which is very good with Head Start, but there's a fall off between middle school and high school. So how do we address that disconnect? And then there's also a lack of internal infrastructure which would allow us to amass a huge deficit, but then also just basic policies and procedures that just are not in place. So we're literally having to rewrite a lot of things to make um, the city run more efficiently, but then also to promote transparency and efficiency from the community's level. And then also enforcement challenges. And enforcement can go through just code enforcement. It also can stem to um, different funds that we have that most cities have, community development block grant, and all of these things that um, if you do not have the proper management or system in place, then you can definitely have some challenges. And then also civic engagement and pride. And when I see the city of Compton, there's almost like the tale of two cities. There's one population that has an extreme strong sense of pride um, that have raised generations of people from there and they really know the history of Compton and how rich it is. And then you have a new population that has moved in in the last 10 to 15 years or even shorter than that, that may not necessarily have that connection to the community and what they know of the community is really um, the same thing that we know, right, from pop culture, excuse me. And so there's always those competing interests of, well, what is the city of Compton? And really, how does that imp um, influence how people want to be engaged in their community? So this is a summary of a 12-point plan. I think you all may have accessed this online, but it just goes through um, some basic things that were really a result of having various charrettes with community members. And so briefly, my campaign was not Asia Brown for mayor because I'm the greatest. It was vision for Compton because I believe that we need a vision for the community. And that's what really resonated with citizens that were despondent to leadership, didn't trust government because we've had a history of corruption and leadership in the city of Compton. And then those people People that live in the community and really have seen the impacts of disrepair and disrepair in terms of infrastructure we have potholes throughout the city there's um, various issues that are really from a systematic breakdown of poor planning and just a real quick summary of that most communities have a capital improvement plan that you pay into every single year so that when you need new um, rail lines or, um, or you need new streets or you need to do your potholes, there's a dedicated source of funds. The city of Compton didn't have that, so where we are is ground zero. And when people are dealing with all of those things and still trying to do basic things like go to work and take kids to school, all they know is government doesn't work. And so we sat down with the community and asked them what are your issues and provided um, solutions that can really bring back a balance and restore order in the city and so these are what those um, items are in summary and we'll go through them throughout the presentation so my strategy for success is to really be able to assess the issues and constraints which i talked about that before and then also identify some uh, prescriptions. And then also to strengthen and expand existing framework. So you have to be able to say, you know, not everything in the city is broken. Some things need to be built, up, uh, built upon and then reestablished in a new way. And then also to establish common cause with colleagues and buy in for main objectives. We live, um, in a democratic society. So I have four council colleagues and we all have equal voting. So I can't just come in with a unilateral strategy and just um, 
by magic make people buy into it. So it, it takes having that leadership capacity to really be able to establish buy-in from your council colleagues and from the community as a whole. But the great thing is that I came in on a mandate from the community with 64% of the vote that were obviously ready for change and they had bought into a new vision for Compton. And so that has given me a lot of clout in terms of what works. Um, and then also my background of being a practitioner and then of course uh, my education background and so I've been able to work very well with the majority of my colleagues to establish this buy-in which is critical because in speaking with mayors across the nation people have their horror stories of councils that are basically like the president in Congress they're you know at, at each other's throats right and of course that's very difficult for things to um, actually happen and then also to identify core objectives, the city plans that must be implemented now in order to provide internal infrastructure for success. So when we look at the city of Compton, they have been, and this is my analogy that I use for a standard citizen, is living paycheck to paycheck. You know, you don't really have a strategy for growth. You don't have a strategy to be able to meet your needs in the future. You're just really dealing with the most critical things that you're giving with at that one time. And that's really how the city has operated for a very long time. And I spoke briefly about a capital improvement plan, a pavement management study. That's just one example of the lack of strategy and what the results can really be for a community. And then also to build coalitions. Coalitions are so important because without coalitions, you don't have the support, the manpower, and the capacity to make real change happen. And then also establish partnerships and stakeholders. Stakeholders and partnerships, they really are the wind beneath their wings. When you're coming in trying to establish a new system, you really have to have a group of like-minded people that can support you and then also bring together organizational capacity and additional resources that may be with, um, out of your reach. And the key word there is leverage. You have to leverage everything. And I think that most um, citizens, and even as a public policy student, we have the misconception that most cities in America have a big fleet of staff under every mayor, but that's not true. I have one staff person um, who's basically my, my chief of staff, do all, is all, and then I have a secretary. And then I have a team of dedicated community um, partners. And then I also have my academic partners like USC that work behind the scenes. And then I also have interns that really um, are able to champion one particular initiative and make some things happen. So it's really about leveraging and bringing all of your assets together. And then for local economic development, what we've been able to do is to really establish policies that can facilitate the type of growth that we want in our community, basic things like design guidelines. When you go to any community that is um, very aesthetically pleasing, there's a complementary palette for facades. And I think we subconsciously don't even recognize that sometimes, and I'm sure that you all do with being um, urban planning students, but the standard person doesn't really understand why this looks good and why this doesn't. And so when you go to really basic things, it's just that, um, that you need to have in order to have that type of cohesion. Also, um, looking at new zone designation and overlays to really reorganize the city. Because when you have um, vacancies within a community, there's obviously a market failure. So how do we address the market failure and then be able to provide a new overlay to be able to transition one area into a new different type of more efficient use? Um, my mission is to have Compton designated as a promise zone. And we know that the city of LA, certain parts were able to get designated, but I believe that Compton is an awesome community in order to be able to access those resources. And I think what that would mean for the city and what could have measurable impact is very significant. So that's something that our administration is working on. And then certain programs, um, and this is just one example, a microloan program so that small businesses can access capital. These things weren't there in the city of Compton. And then also, to create new institutions. So we are in process of creating a community development corporation in the city of Compton in order to be more nimble, to be able to be more diverse, to access different sources of funding, and then to be able to really organize our economic development activity in one um, concerted effort. And then we're also in process of establishing a business accelerator, which will be open um, this summer, with, and that's another result of partnership, excuse me. And then a big thing is to strengthen the Compton Business Chamber. Unfortunately, within our campaign, 
season, our chamber had got very, very political. And so when the person that they supported was not elected, they kind of sat on the sidelines. And so I reached out to them immediately because I had a relationship with them prior. And it literally took almost seven months for us to get back on one page. And so I think it's critical to be able to strengthen your um, Chamber of Commerce because they're really your catch-all for your businesses that are looking to um, relocate within the community, but also to be able to expand the um, the core capacity of your existing corporations. And Compton is very rich in um, corporate assets. So how are we able to diversify them and turn a property owner or a business owner into a stakeholder? And employment development. So we are working with USC Center for Economic Development for the establishment of an advanced manufacturing partnership, which is a zone designation. That um, grant will be submitted uh, the first, I believe it's April 12th of um, this month, and so we're very excited about that. But what that means to us is that we'll be able to connect our local industry, which is heavily um, in manufacturing and logistics with our local academic institutions, so Compton College, also um, Cal State Dominguez Hills, of course USC, um, trade tech, and then other organizations around different trades that are made available, and then of course our trades union. So that's gonna be critical when we look at the region as a whole. How many of you all are familiar with R1 or R2 funding? So R2 is transportation money. Um, and R1 was actually transportation dollars that the city, um, I'm sorry, that the citizens of Los Angeles County voted um, several years ago in order to um, self-tax themselves to provide critical um, transportation funding throughout the region. So when we look at improvements to the Blue Line, when we look at the, the Crenshaw Line, when we look at the Expo Line, that was all a result of R1 funding. And so the next phase of um, R2 funding, which we're actually in process of crafting that legislation now, will be critical to communities like Compton as we're now focusing on goods movement corridors. Um, we're also looking at logistics or clean freight. We're also looking at expanding or enhancing additional um, rail lines throughout the region for more connectivity, and then also retrofitting the existing lines to be able to be um, at the cutting edge in the next 50 years. And so. Um, in years past, Compton really was not at the table, and so we didn't get um, a significant share of those funding. But when we look at transportation assets, Compton is very centrally located. We have the Union Pacific Line, we have the Alameda Corridor going straight through Compton, which is the major um, entryway for goods movement throughout the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and which we know is, is the number one goods movement corridor for the entire world, right? And so all of these containers, they're coming through the city of Compton and other areas to get to the entire region and the nation. And so we're now looking at critical infrastructure that, and this is how I put everything into context. If the city of Compton decided that we were not going to allow um, goods movement to go through our community, what would that mean to the entire region? Where would those trucks go? Where would those containers go? What about the containers that are actually going through the Alameda corridor every single day? What would that mean to the entire region? And so those are the questions that we're now posing as we consider R2 funding to make certain that Compton is at the table and that also we provide a, a vehicle for local job development. And that's one thing that has to be at the forefront of this is that anytime you have infrastructure development, infrastructure improvements, that is a mechanism for new jobs and those jobs are for local people that live right here in Los Angeles County and they're high paying jobs. And so we are actually putting together a summit this summer to be able to put all of those institutions together and then say, okay, hey, what are the jobs that are coming online in the next 10 years? And then how do we make sure that we provide a pipeline for our local people to be able to be trained and skilled to be able to access these jobs? And then we're also working on federal legislation uh, with Metro as a partnership to be able to say, hey, federal government, when you provide local municipalities or, or regional entities with federal dollars, the current rules say that you can't have local hire. But what that means is that we are, we're providing an entryway for people to come from all across the nation to access these jobs that are right here in the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. And just to put things into perspective, when we look at per capita income, Los Angeles, while it may be perceived to, as the world is maybe this mecca for, you know, great job earnings and um, nice homes and cars and all of these things, but when you look at the economics of it all, Los Angeles is f almost at the bottom of the totem pole for per capita income in proportion for the entire nation. So we have to be able to look at how do we actually get our local people these high paying jobs. So that's going to be critical looking into the future. And then also, 
um, programs. So we're creating employment specific programs to really meet the needs of our community, not just unemployed, underemployed, people that have um, maybe had a felony um, in the past and that are looking for a way to re-enter into the workforce. And then institutions were actually um, created a partnership with the Compton Courthouse to be able to um, remove people from probation if they meet certain guidelines within our program. Also the clear driver's licenses, which is a big thing for people that have had some type of issue. Sometimes people can't get a job because they have $1,500 worth of tickets, and that means that they don't have a, a valid driver's license. And so making certain that we can really remove impediments for people that are actually skilled or may that have um, education from um, being outside of the workforce. And then also expungement. So we have all of these programs into one bundle to be able to meet the needs of the entire community. Um, this is one example of a job fair that we're doing, and it's a resource fair really that's actually happening this Saturday. And it's a, all of our partners are listed here. And it's really a conglomeration, not just for a job fair, but we have workshops, we have seminars. People can literally come on site and be able to access expungement services. Um, there are over 200 jobs that will be made available that day to people that are ready. And then we also have seminars of how to get your resume in order, how to prepare for a job interview. And then people can also sign up for the nursing field that day with a panel of experts. So it's gonna be an awesome, awesome event and we're expecting a huge turnout. And then youth development. So I'm really big on kids. I just think they're our future, of course. And um, there's such value in really investing in the next generation. And so we've been working to establish some youth enrichment programs outside of Compton College. And so, I'm sorry, outside of Compton Unified School District. And just a quick city one-on-one, the council, does not influence the school district. Most cities in America actually have a separate um, Compton Unified School District board. Most people think, and I think if you're being logical, that the, the city council and the school board will work one, in, one on one in tandem, but that usually doesn't happen in real life. And I've learned from speaking with other mayors across the nation that that's usually the case. And so we've had, um, I call it political residue of people who you know don't really want change but they have to understand that you know change is here and either you know you're going to get on board or you're going to be left behind and so i always look for ways to be able to implement change but to almost have the path of least resistance so we do have mentorship programs that are operating within the schools now um, we have a young men's mentorship program and then we're also launching a young ladies mentorship program in the fall and those programs make a tremendous impact um, when you really look at the population. And then we're also looking at establishing a Saturday Science Academy, which I was a um, product of, and I know how firsthand that can really change the trajectory of a kid when they never maybe have considered a career in the, in the um, arts or in, um, in sciences. And being able to be able to do things that other kids their age can't do or in their environment has a huge impact on their self-esteem. And so it's really a two-fold program. And then we also have, um, a workforce development program that we're launching this summer in partnership with RBI and the Urban Youth Academy. So one half will be sports as a carrot, the other half will be instruction in the evening and the internship component and we'll actually be paying our kids and so that's something that we are very excited about and working hard on that program as well. And then my ultimate goal, and this is more of a long-term goal, is to have citywide preschool within the, within the community and to have a universal preschool. And I think that Head Start does a tremendous job within our community and we know the stats of kids that go to preschool and what that means for them throughout their whole entire life. Um, how many of you all have heard about the school to prison pipeline? So everyone, most, so the school, the school to prison pipeline is basically that kids that can't read well by the third grade, they are 90% more likely to be incarcerated at some point in their life. And so these facts are actually um, tangible. They've been um, documented, they're staggering, but they're really real. And so we're really having to be able to look at ourselves, look at our education system and figure out how do we break down this pipeline. And so it has been proven that preschool has a tremendous impact on kids. And so I believe having a universal um, preschool within the community will um, have a tremendous impact on the community for generations to come. And then health and wellness. So we have healthy food collaboratives. We have a farmer's market now in the city of Compton. We also have organic food co-op that has started um, at the end of last year. And then we're also putting together a healthy food campaign to really be able to educate people on the importance of eating healthy foods. And then also that they're affordable and right here in your local community. And so that's something that we'll be launching um, this um, summer. And then we are also 
launching a Healthy City campaign, Let's Move Compton. So we have great partners that are actually funded to um, make this happen within our community. And our goal is to be able to have a whole citywide um, health turnover. And when we look at the statistics of um, black and brown people and the impacts of high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol, there's a huge issue. We have to be able to address that within our community. And so we're looking at ways to be able to incorporate healthy food and fitness into our city. And then also to bring people back to the parks. Because if you don't use parks, they're usually be used for something less desirable like gangs or other um, maybe selling drugs. So we're really trying to make sure that we can get people back into the parks. And we actually have some really nice parks in um, many areas of the city that um, are heavily utilized. But we also have a lot of smaller pocket parks that can be utilized as well for fitness activities. And then also organic gardening. We have our own organic garden here in the city. And there's also a great health education component that um, provides free materials, free um, instruction from a master gardener, and they're available to Compton residents. And then we also have a great partnership with the kitchen community that has um, facilitated or in process of putting um, three organic gardens in our schools as a pilot program. So really teaching our kids how to farm, the importance of healthy living, and then having them be able to have access to that on their campus. So we're really excited about that as well. And then for public safety, public safety is really huge. Um, and I kind of started with the, the hardest issues quick um, first, excuse me. Right after I was elected, we had a series of shootings within the community. And so we had a community, um, it was called a community emergency. And so we put together a team of experts of law enforcement that touch Compton. So, and we have a task force that meets monthly and they actually have two different subcommittees that provide different initiatives in the community. And the FBI, the Compton Sheriff's Department, which is our local law enforcement, we have our code enforcement, the school police, the DEA, um, different county officials, probation. So everyone that has anything to do with law enforcement or enforcement within the city of Compton, we're now on one page. We've coordinated joint stings. We've had tremendous um, success in reducing crime in certain areas of the community. And we've also heavily focused on human trafficking, which is um, an issue in the city of Compton and really throughout the city of Los Angeles. And as part of that, our city attorney and I worked on new legislation to be able to promote the type of outcomes that we want. So when we look at Long Beach Boulevard, which is within the city of Compton, there's a high concentration of motels, where those motels obviously are not filled with tourists. They're filled with people who are soliciting sex um, for money, and, we, and they're filled with people that are paying for sex um, with money. And so when we look at how does this happen, where well, they're usually with hourly motel rentals. So what we did was we eliminated hourly motel rentals in the city of Compton. And that has had a, a tremendous impact on reducing human trafficking activity within our city. Um, literally, um, at one point, you can drive down the street um, during the day and you may see a few women walking up and down the street. But if you go down to Long Beach Boulevard um, today, you will not see that type of activity. We've also shut down one motel that was a hub for illegal activity. That um, motel is actually going to be used now for a human health and services building with an organization called HPP Cares um, in the city of Long Beach. Um, they wanted to be located in the city of Compton, so they bought that building and we'll be celebrating their grand opening next month. And then there's also another motel, the Travel Lodge, that is interested in selling, which that organization is also in process of purchasing as well for another um, community use. And so from just doing one thing, one policy change, we, we were able to really see what type of impact that they can have on changing the entire landscape of a community. And a side note, the motels, they kind of had a little coalition there. And the leader of the motel, kind of I call him the motel pack, um, <laughs> he moved to Texas. And he also indicated that none of the um, motel owners are making any money anymore. And so they all want to sell. And so he said, if you know anyone that would like to purchase, you know, these motels were available. And so that's great news for our community. And, um, and that's just really one example of changing policy to change the outcome. And then we also established a Public Safety Advisory Commission, which is a, a resource for citizens to be able to come and to voice their concerns with local law enforcement. Um, and then also to be able to improve the relationship between the community and the Compton Sheriff's Department. 
Um, when communities have the sheriffs as a law enforcement entity, there's a lot of rotation um, with the personnel, and that prevents the, re the establishment of a firm relationship with the community. And so it's difficult to do um, traditional community policing and really to have that relationship. And so we've established a town sheriff program that provides monthly town forums throughout the community um, for citizens to be able to speak directly with law enforcement to voice concerns. We also have um, a variety of interaction points that weren't there in the past and we've seen um, relationships really be able to be reestablished and built. And so we're very excited about that as well. And then out of the Public Safety Advisory Commission, we have a prevention and intervention team. So this team is dedicated directly to gang violence or gang activity. And so we have a prevention aspect, which is where the Big Brothers program came out of, and they actually administer that program within a school. And then we also have um, an inter intervention team. So we actually have a team of about 26 gang members that are the leaders within their community. I'll be meeting with them in um, the next couple of weeks for a sit down and to discuss ways of how we can end violence um, in the community. So we're very excited about that. And we also have a response team that is in process of being formated, which will, um, when there's a shooting or any type of violent activity within the, the community, this team is actually dispatched to the scene to be able to stop retaliation. Because that's usually how um, a series of, of violence happens is one person retaliates from another. And so this team really diffuses that activity and it's been proven to be very successful in other communities. And so that's just a snapshot of what that team is doing. And then for the prevention component, we have a new public service announcement campaign. How many of y'all remember Just Say No? Any of y'all remember that? That was kind of big when I was growing up, and we are doing a revamp for this generation on Just Say No. So it won't be called Just Say No, but it's something that's relevant to this um, generation to make sure that they can understand that you can still be cool and not do drugs. You can still be cool and not, you know, go into gangs or to drink alcohol or to take your prescription drugs and all these other things that really weren't available when we were younger, um, but that are available now. And so the other component will also be to make parents aware because most parents don't even know you know what's out there they don't really know what their kids are doing and so this will be a great resource and then we also have a website which is under construction called protectcompankids.org and so this website will be a catch-all of information and resources for um, parents to really be able to understand what resources are available within the county and then also to be able to provide a form for young people to come and to access information as well and this is um, year one of action. So I have a series of initiatives that we have done in the last nine months. And this is the um, community um, the community safety warning that was issued that I spoke to you all earlier about, which happened in August, which is really the launching of our community policing efforts. And this is the task force that I spoke to you all about. And the main goal is to end gang violence and also to eradicate human trafficking, which I'll spend a little bit of time on human trafficking for a moment. Um, the majority of domestic human trafficking is involves minors. So 90% of young women are actually kids, and I think that most people look at prostitution as a victimless crime, and they think that, oh, those women want to be out there and sell their bodies, and that's just too bad for them. But the majority of those people, young men and women, are actually minors. And under the law, their minors cannot actually give consent to have sex with an adult. And so when we look at, well, who's involved in the prostitution ring, the question is, well, who are the pimps? Well, now in today's age, pimps are actually gang members. The main reason that we see pimps involved, I'm sorry, gang members as pimps outside of money, outside of, you know, moving drugs is that it is actually under our current legal system is actually easier or it carries less jail time to sell people than it is to sell drugs. So, and that's ridiculous, right? We live in the United States of America, and we think that you know, domestic trafficking or human trafficking is probably really an international issue, which is not, not the case. And I think the guy in the back, he probably knows a little bit of something about human trafficking and domestic human trafficking. But the majority of people that are involved in the sex trade in the United States are US citizens. They're usually um, kids that are from an actual household. They're usually runaways. They are not just poor people. They're not just people of color. Um, human trafficking impacts everyone. And we are now looking at ways to change our current laws. Um, 
with our secretary, I'm sorry, our attorney general, Kamala Harris, also working with our um, U.S. government AG to really see how can we change those laws to really make the crime fit the jail time. And we actually have some two cases that are being tried by the FBI in connection with our sheriff's department as a result of our activities to be able to build a long-standing case. And the goal is to be able to give these pimps a 15-year jail sentence. And you know, federal time carries a lot of weight in terms of deterring people from doing certain types of activities. So, and we're also looking at reforming the current law. So right now, if I'm a John and I buy sex, I may maybe, maybe my car will get impounded for a couple of days and I'll pay $1,000, maybe, or community service, restitution. And so there are a group of local lawmakers from our supervisors to um, state senators, assembly people, saying that, you know what, let's change that $1,000 to a $10,000 fine. Let's make it commiserate with the DUI, right? And then let's also impound their car for 30 days. Let's do a, sh a shame campaign. Let's make sure that the young ladies, since they are minors, that they don't even have to physically testify against a pimp. If they name a pimp as the perpetrator, then they should be able to be prosecuted. And then let's look at the jail time for the pimp. So let's really be able to change the system of how we really address human trafficking within the state of California. And so that's something that we are working um, very stringently on. And we've seen a tremendous amount of impact and movement in the last six months. And so there's actually a symposium with one of our new partners on this effort, the YWCA, on April 25th. And it's really a whole conglomeration of lawmakers um, just everyone coming to the table and saying, you know, with every form of government, every person representing a different form of government, what can we do about this? And let's do it quickly because our kids are not for sale. And so that's just something, something that has been a, a result of our efforts and really shining the light on human trafficking occurring in the city of Compton. And this is just a picture of our public safety task force. And as you can see, we have a, a good group of people that occur. And then we talked about the hourly um, motel rentals el elimination. And these are just policy prescriptions. And policy prescriptions are really, really important. And I think that we think as a practitioner that, you know, the work is just, you know, we need to just get in there and roll our sleeves up and, you know, let's just go out there and make a difference. And so, you know, I went out there for about eight years and made a difference. And what really motivated me to run for office is that I realized that we have to change the policies, we have to change the laws in order to have a broad-based impact. Because when you think about how much impact that one individual can have in a place, it's really within that, that small circle, right? But when you can be able to step into a leadership role, and this is my PSA of why urban planners and policy students should run for office, because we need competent people as politicians and not politicians as politicians. And so <laughs> if we can have people that actually have a background and that just is not representative of big business, but they actually have values and maybe they don't want to um, ascend up to the political ladder, which is nothing wrong with that. Um, if you can make a, a larger impact by going to another level, I think that you should do it. But there's so much work to be done, I believe, at the local level. Um, but if we can get really qualified pragmatic practitioners that make the policies, and I think that a lot of our social challenges would really be able to um, be mitigated um, from those changes. And so that's just my little commercial of why you all should think about it. Um, and then also partnering with advocacy, advocacy groups. I spoke about our partnership with the YWCA, state and regional leaders. So this is actually happening right now in real time. And so we'll be able to keep you all updated on the um, journey to be able to identify this issue and then also to eradicate it. And this is um, in November 21st, Supervisor Mark Willie Thomas organized a march in the city of Compton and about a thousand people came out. And the goal was to bring awareness to domestic human trafficking because most people again think that it's not a local issue, right? But the truth is it happens in Los Angeles, in parts of the Valley, in Long Beach, it happens in Linwood. And so all of us in some form or fashion are affected. And this is just a more photo from that march. As you can see, there are a lot of people that came out against human trafficking. And so 
for our year of action with civic engagement, we started basic things like cleanups. There have been an awesome organization called the Compton Initiative, and you can find out more information about the Compton Initiative at justdogood.org, but they do quarterly cleanups in the city, and they bring about 2,000 people from all across Southern California to make a tremendous impact within the community of Compton. And so I've been working with that organization for several years, and my commitment was that, you know what, we can do our part here in the city of Compton as well. And so we also have a quarterly cleanup in the city. And it has made a tremendous impact in really boosting the morale of our citizens and showing them that you can make a tremendous influence on the way your neighborhood looks right now. You don't need the city to come out and to um, beautify your area. You can actually get together a group of people and keep your community clean. And so this is just a couple of photos from one of our cleanups that we have on a quarterly basis. And then this is another initiative. It's called Prayer for Peace. And my core group that I was targeting were the churches. And why churches? Because we have 200 in the city of Compton. And when I think about 200 churches anywhere, and especially in a 10 square mile radius, my question is, well, what's going on with the church? Obviously, they're inside of the four walls. They're not going outside because we have all of these issues within the community. And, you know, regardless of your faith or what you believe in, what you don't believe in, I look at what are viable institutions to affect change within our community. And churches have people. Churches are full of people that understand a leadership um, hierarchy. And so they can easily assemble about 50 to 100 people and usually more than that to be able to come out and make an impact on any given day. And so my goal is that if I can just get 10% of that 200 to be able to adopt certain initiatives, then we can definitely have some great manpower to make local change at the civic level and to um, increase the level of civic engagement within our community. And this is an example of one of our um, events, we had almost um, about 500 people that came out and they were really standing for peace within our community. And the last part of the civic engagement was a call to action. So when I'm thinking about our 200 churches and I think about our 100 plus nonprofits, I put together a symposium and the goal was to unite, elevate, improve and to serve. But the biggest goal was to put everybody on one page. Working in communities, I've always seen awesome, awesome organizations doing the best that they can with the small capacity that they have, but they're, everyone's doing their own thing. And so our goal was to put together um, a, a great team of people that are centered around certain issues or certain initiatives and have them work together. And so we put together a great symposium about 100 to 125 organizations were represented here. And we looked over our certain, um, our vision initiatives. And so as a result, we talked about all of these different issues that we're talking about today. And as a result, we actually have um, some organizations training other organizations on how to implement successful programs. We've also had a peak in civic engagement from the, um, the, the civic cleanup side, beautification side. So we actually have different cleanups that are smaller going on throughout the community. One organization actually adopted a park. We have um, a lot of activity going on as a result of people just coming together on one page. And so the next symposium, they'll happen on a quarterly basis, which will be to bring in access to capital. There are a lot of institutional challenges with nonprofits. I probably, I don't know, on any given day, I probably meet about five people that have a nonprofit. And it may just be them. It may just be, you know, maybe it's in their head sometimes. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a real nonprofit, but everyone has a nonprofit. And so my goal is, well, how do we get you up to capacity? Because if I can have, you know, 50 bustling nonprofits, then I think the city of Compton would be on, on top of the world. And so our goal is to how do we strengthen our nonprofits? How do we weed out the ones that maybe are not really a nonprofit or, you know, can, can you guys work together? And my goal is, if we're all nonprofits and the goal is to not profit, then you should have no problem working with another nonprofit <laughs> to achieve your core objectives, right? Right? And I think that kind of puts people on the carpet and it weaves other people that are looking for, um, and I'm sorry, I, this is what I call them poverty pimps. And these are people that pimp poverty. They come to communities and they want to be able to access resources or funding for their own personal gain. And so that's how we're able to weed out, you know, those people that are not there for the right reasons and then strengthen the other organizations that are really doing great things. 
And this is a great, um, a, a quick summary of what I learned in nine months. And today is my one, my nine month anniversary of being mayor of the city of Compton. And I learned that you have to face tough issues head on. And I think that most people thought I was crazy to start addressing crime, to talk about our infrastructure, to talk about all these issues that really matter to people because the, um, the political implication, and I think the, the natural um, response is to kind of don't talk about those things unless, you know, do a rah-rah party or do a community fair or something that is just like a one-day type of situation that has no impact, right? And people feel good about it. They feel good about it. When election time comes up, they can say, remember, I threw all these parties and you guys came and had a good time and we're still in the same shape that we were in, you know, four years ago, right? And so I decided to, to really focus on tough issues because if you don't have a firm foundation for growth and you're not going to have change. And so I'm willing to uncover the dirt and to get to the bottom of what's really needed in our community, even if it seems that, you know, we're taking a few steps back in certain directions, but in order to have a firm foundation is critical. And I think it's critical in the city's success. And that strategy is really counterintuitive to a politician because people think in four year time frames or whatever your term is, right? But these things are not going to have tremendous impact. Some will have tremendous impact now, but some are going to take you know five years six years to really be firmly established but that's really what's necessary for change and then I also learned that everyone doesn't want change even if change is better and when you think about it change is hard in general for a lot of people especially um, older people older persuasion but um, we all automatically assume that you know if it's better people want it but that's not true when you get into the real world. Some people just really don't want change, even if it looks better, it feels better, it sounds better, they just don't want it. So you have to be able to recognize that and be able to move on. And then also the importance of having a strategy. We've been able to have a litany of great sponsors and partners because we actually have a strategy. Recently, um, two weeks ago, the White House came to visit us in the city of Compton and they endorsed some of our programs and they were, able to do that because we had a strategy and we have a framework in place and we have a way to measure our improvement and our objectives and really to be able to have a return on that investment. So strategy is very critical. Also, find common ground quickly. Progress depends on it. You have to be able to find a common ground with whomever you're working with, even how small it is and build upon that so that you can continue to move forward. And then also to know your allies. You have to know who's on your team. If you don't know who's on your team, they may be an enemy, and enemies try to stop progress. So it's very, very critical that even if you're a practitioner, whether you never ever go into politics, you have to really understand who are your coalition partners because politics is, and there's a, a famous book, you may have heard it by Tip O'Neill called All Politics is Local. You all should pick it up. It's like a quick read. You probably read it like in three hours. But it really puts um, politics into perspective, and I think that's really important for planners and policymakers because you can't um, be a planner and you can't be a policymaker without taking politics into perspective because it really sets the context of how things happen, why things don't happen, and really how to get things done. So pick that book up. And then also, partner, partner, partner. And I think that depends on your type of personality. Some people are just individualists and they like you know, doing their own thing by themselves, but in the real world, when you have a monumental task, partnership is really the air that you breathe. You can't do anything by yourself. You need partners. So find your partners, find your allies, lay out the strategy and make it happen. And then also, do what you can. I mean, the city of Compton has a lot of challenges. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. USC wasn't built in 10 years. I think um, the last time I was on campus, well, I've been on campus more um, in the last maybe year or so, but when I graduated in 2005, some of these buildings weren't here. Um, you know, parking structure, all of, I mean, the, the whole neighborhood looks completely different. And when I think about it, I remember I used to work in the um, sustainability department, um, hi, Professor Myers, and, um, they actually used to have this this rendering of what the community was going to uh, what, what the community is going to look like. Excuse me, and the community meant USC and the surrounding area. And so it was like this really master strategic plan. And I said, Wow, you know, is the university going to make this happen? And there's, oh yeah, this is a 10, 15 year plan. And to see it materialize is it's just amazing. And you have to be able to understand that tremendous impact is going to take time, it's a process, but you have to be committed to the outcomes, be committed to the strategy, don't change the strategy, and know that um, 
change is inevitable, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work and dedication. And so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, still today, my best sit students sit right over here. <laughs> so that, I mean, some of the best ones are over here right now and I'm teaching at four o'clock and there's my best students are over there too. So there's something going on there. I haven't done a study on it, but um, <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being such a wonderful role model. This is so great. I actually came to USC in 2006, so we just missed each other, but I would have been honored to have you in my class. So it's wonderful to meet you today. Um, so I think one of the things that's really exciting um, to listen to Mayor Brown um, is you know first of all it's a sort of big relief here at the Price School because you were saying all these things and I kept thinking about the authors that we teach and I thought okay we've so we're pre preparing our students to do this stuff this is what you do day to day and this is what we teach in class so that was really exciting and I want to just talk very briefly about just two things you said that really resonated with me first of all you started off saying talking about the difference between places that people want to live and the places that people don't want to live, right? And sort of understanding the places people actually want to live. And this really harkens back to the great urbanist Jane Jacobs and her concern about blighted neighborhoods and the way in which you make a neighborhood truly vital is you make people want to stick around. They can get richer, they can get smarter, they can have two kids, they can get divorced, but they're tied to their neighborhood and then they're invested in their neighborhood. And those are the places that really succeed. And you're doing this with Compton, which is so exciting. Um, the second thing I thought an awful lot about was that um, Michael Porter, who's a business professor at Harvard, wrote a really important article, which any of you who to take my classes read, which is the competitive advantage of the inner city. And his idea was you don't hand things out to cities. You teach them how to swim on their own, how to fish on their own. You teach them how to sustain themselves. Um, and you, you treat it as a system. I mean, that's, those are your words, not Michael Porter's, but that you're looking at a whole system here. And, um, and I think that that's an extraordinarily effective way to not just economic develop an area, which is what I do, but to develop the community um, and the social aspects. And, and there, were, there were six ways you did this. You talked about, you talked about com community relationships, which are essential. Um, neighborhood level competitive advantage. We talk about city competitive advantage. What about this, the, the neighborhoods that uphold that advantage? Um, connecting to other neighborhoods, whether it's socially or through transportation. Um, the role of community and social development and economic development. I mean, we, 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 we sort of talk about them together, but we actually teach them separately. They are crucial um, to work together. Um, the importance of education and skills. Um, and, and I think this one is really important and we, we take it for granted, but the day-to-day -day ways in which we make people's lives better, okay? Whether it's that they can access organic food, whether they can get to school on time, whether they feel safe in school, whether they feel safe walking down the block. This prosaic part of living in a place is important to this, this first goal, which is making people want to stick around. And I'll just finish up by saying that what is so exciting about what Mayor Brown talked about today is that policy really does matter. We, we really can change things. I mean, you are such an inspiration for how this happens. So thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your feedback. And it's just a great honor. And I just want to give you all a commercial for USC. <laughs> now, and they didn't tell me to do this, but I'm just letting you all know that. This education that I received here from the Price School was phenomenal to the point to where I was working full time as a graduate student and I was working in the city of Gardena, but I literally applied what I was learning in school on the job immediately and everything was at the cutting edge. So you all are so fortunate. Um, please soak up everything that you can from your professors. Um, they're phenomenal. They're industry leading. They're awesome, amazing. I can't say enough about them. And I actually still have some of my um, books and some of my um, feedback that I've received and, you know, keep some of that stuff because it's really going to be useful. So that's just my USC um, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, I lived in Compton for a long time and my mother still lives there. And uh, her biggest complaint is about whatever the cost that are on the utility bills yes. for the infrastructure. And I keep trying to explain that that's just not the water bill. Right. Yes, we actually had a huge um, water town hall a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about the difference between Compton has its own water system. And so 
Compton is also 125 years old. So the difference between Compton and Carson is that Carson is about 50 years old and they may um, actually have a different water district. So water districts usually pay, they carry on the cost of capital improvement to their customers as those projects occur. In the city of Compton, because the infrastructure was so outdated, they floated a water bond to be able to quickly assess and to be able to quickly implement these improvements in a shorter amount of time frame. So it seems that our bill kind of is much higher than surrounding cities, but in about five to 10 years, our bill will probably be less than theirs because they're actually paying the real time cost of those improvements in those today's dollars. So it's a cost savings in the long run for citizens, even though it may not feel like it right now. Okay, well. <laughs> Tell her sorry. She, she did enjoy some great water rates for a long time though. <laughs> Defer, deferred maintenance is something. Um, any other questions, comments? I saw one over here. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, first, I always say that I am such a big fan of you. And all of my classmates know this. I'm like, tell me that. because I want to go back to my community and make it better. Um, yeah. So I feel like we were very similar in that, in that instinct. And I was just wondering, how do you deal with, um, well, how do you deal with one, people, because there are people in this program, my classmates, my professors, who are very like, you know, Detroit is so bad, you know, the stigma of, of being from a, a city that has um, such a heavy weight on its shoulders. How do you address that when um, you're going to stakeholders or you're trying to build these partnerships and they just have their mindset like, no, we're not investing in confidence only, one way and what are the steps that you can suggest to people in my stage who are about to graduate um, to kind of building up building up that um, that team of positive people to you know to take back the city um, people return on investment is what makes the world go round and so you have to p speak to potential investors or partners in terms that mean something to them um, when I look at Compton the, the challenges with Compton and their and the, the infamous reputation are really from you know pop culture media people believe what they hear or you know a couple of rap songs just really put a whole shroud on the community and so I speak to people with facts and then I also have a strategy so when you can give people real facts you can have a strategy and then you speak to what matters to them which is their return on their investment any shrewd investor can see the opportunity that's within a community and so people that um, have a huge trajectory or can um, assess a certain level of risk, they look at places like Compton and Detroit as gold mines for potential investment later. So just do the work, get some really thick skin, and then get some real thick skin, and then <laughs> don't care what people think. Um, you know, everyone's not going to see what you see, and that's called vision. If everybody had it, then they wouldn't need certain um, prolific leaders. And so know that what you see is not going to be what everybody else sees. And it doesn't even matter because all you need to do is match up what you see and what other people can potentially see or buy into. And so that's what leadership is. That's what planning is. Um, and I use the example of USC. If people 50 years ago would believe that USC would look like this in the surrounding area, they wouldn't believe it. And, and many people wouldn't have moved, right? And so that's just another example. But Detroit is going to be all right. I know some great people, um, developer-wise, that are in Detroit right now with some massive, huge plans. So just get your education, get your experience, and go back and tear Detroit up and, and show them that, you know, Detroit is awesome. It's a world-class city. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, Jack, you kind of half-asked my question. Okay. <laughs> but I'm really interested in how you're partnering with uh, media. Um, Hollywood and the music industry to try to reverse, you know, some of the damage that's been done, um, you know, throughout the, you know, the kind of uh, 80s and 90s gang culture and, and so forth. It seems like such a powerful medium mm -hmm. that was able to change, change uh, the trajectory of a uh, It seems like it would be, uh, you know, just as powerful to change that. Absolutely. I have um, put together a concept called the Redemption Project, and this project is going to be a platform for people that have come straight out of Compton to come back to Compton and make something positive and really um, one form is a documentary and then my ultimate goal is to have them do a remake of that song into something that's relevant and something that's positive and I don't um, deal with rosy pictures you know we still have issues within the city but it's not you know what people think that it is and so I 
uh, my goal is to have them tell their story of how they grew up in Compton, their family's history, and then how that really helped impact them and help them to um, catapult into their success. And I think that really having um, people speak in their own words and not just a four minute song, can, I think that's gonna have a tremendous impact. Um, and so we're putting together a team, I actually met with a couple of students here at USC um, a few days ago about this um, project, but we're still shopping it around. And I've been approached by um, docuseries people and all of that. And so my goal is to be able to redirect them to something like this instead of a show about me or my candidacy, because I think that's, a non-factor so at this point so that's that's a project that we're looking at um, actually before I moved back to um, the city of Compton my husband and I we were what really impacted our decision to move to Compton was that we saw so much work that needed to be done and so we had actually started going to a local church there and that church had like a huge outreach and so we did a lot of things within the community and one thing was um, going out and speaking to prostitutes and giving them an option of if they wanted to get out of that lifestyle and so um, I was committed to the work before I was elected, and I knew that this would, me being the mayor, would give me a larger platform to speak to the issues, but there was already a great framework of people that were really committed. Um, we also, I didn't put this in the presentation, but we just opened up a, a drop-in center um, on the boulevard. It's called Restoration Diversion Services. So young women and men can actually walk into this drop-in center that's on the strip and they can be transported to another location. They also can get access to critical services. They can work on their GED. They can actually um, get counseling. So this is something um, that's really been underway for a long time. But the biggest thing that I talk about, and I can tell you why politicians don't wanna touch it because it doesn't, um, it doesn't add to their political toolkit in their mind. And most people and most politicians they shy away from hard issues because once you, it's like Pandora's box, once you start focusing on these issues, there's so many different things that come along with that that you're going to have to, number one, acknowledge, and then number two, address. And most people don't want to address the real issues. And um, one way to really get leaders' attentions is to really speak to them in fact terms. You know, how many people in Orange County are affected by this? What does a standard family that has maybe had their child, you know, maybe they ran away and maybe they're involved in human trafficking. You have to really put a human picture with it. And I would say definitely consider doing a, a public service campaign. <coughs> and images speak a thousand words. We talked about the, um, the impact of, of rap music on Compton, but you can put together a huge um, media campaign and maybe do like a large viewing and invite your local leaders and you know have a discussion about it. You know, how does this impact you? So that could be something that you could really um, be able to put together and to, to do and really probably at a very minimal budget, you can get some awesome USC students to help you out with that. I would say um, everyone has a different Trojan experience. Um, my student experience was probably not the standard student experience. I worked full time, I went to school at night. Um, I was able to take certain classes during the day on a limited basis, but I wasn't a standard student um, because I had to support myself. So I didn't really have the whole, um, I would say the full Trojan experience. And so that's something that my husband and I look forward to affording our kids to just allow them to be students and you know do some internships at a you know no, no cost basis. But I have one of my, um, colleagues that's also a Trojan here with me, um, Damien, wave your hand in the back. And so he, um, he and I actually worked in the city of Inglewood together. And I would say that the Trojan connection is really real. It's, it's, really, it's really prolific. And I think that you don't have to, if you don't feel that you're establishing that now, it's okay. Um, just continue to do the work and do what you can, but they're out there. And once you're out there working, they'll just clump together and make some awesome things happen. And literally the support that I've had from our alumni is tremendous. And it's almost like a secret society, you guys. And I didn't really think that it was really real until you know, I started really um, the practitioner side. But literally when people find out that you're a Trojan, they just open up the whole window to you and whatever you need, it's like yours. So rest assured, the Trojan connection is really real in 2014. So. You guys just, you know, make, make the connections that you can right now, but still stay connected with your professors because I still have great um, relationships with my professors from um, economic development and because our professors actually do real stuff. They're not just, you know, theory people. They're, you know, like Professor Myers back there. He's a pro prolific um, demographer and does, you know, he does a, a lot of real things. So the more connected you can stay with your staff and your particular concentration is gonna be amazing because they'll provide you with resources, um, insight, um, 
pro bono consultation, um, <laughs> all types of great things to just make you um, really, really effective. So think about the Trojan Connection in a, a whole well-rounded way. Thank you all for the opportunity. Yeah.